Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them, for they know not that every single piece of land they have ever lived on or sold is stolen land. Forgive them, for they know not that my rainbow soul they reject will forever love proudly and loudly. Forgive them, for they know not that every black body they scoff at is sacred, beautiful, and regal. Forgive them, for they know not that they can continue to try to exterminate us, but we will continue to rise up. Forgive them, for they know not that as they try to silence us, they are giving us megaphones. Forgive them, for they know not that the language they cannot understand or speak and often ridicule is spoken all throughout the world. Forgive them, for they know not that every tree that is cut down is the source of the very air we need to survive. Forgive them, for they know not that we need to scream Black Lives Matter because we have been taught that they don't. Forgive them, for they know not that modifying history for our children does not mean it did not happen. Forgive them, for they know not that being a missionary to countries with brown people is not a photo op. Forgive them, for they know not that trans people are people, and people need nurturing and comforting and love. Forgive them, for they know not that what they do to the least of these, they are doing to you over and over again. Forgive them, for they know not that equality, equity, and justice are not synonyms. Forgive them, for they know not that if one of us is suffering, all of us are suffering. Forgive them, for they know not that bullying and violence does not make them stronger. Forgive them, for they know not that misgendering and outing a person can be deadly. Forgive them, for they know not that being comforted is not the same as being comfortable. Forgive them, for they know not that we know that they know. Mother, father, parent, forgive me, for I have acted as though I know not what I do.
Today, you will be with me in paradise. The scripture says that two criminals were also hung next to Jesus, one on his right and the other on his left. One repented and the other did not. Depending on the onlooker's perspective, the remorseful individual could have been seen on either Jesus' left or right. We take one's hurt one person's words to our heart, but dismiss the other's protest. Let God decide their fate, since, the, since in dispensing our justice, we have completed our task of maintaining the rule of law. Are we free of responsibility and accountability now that one enters Jesus' kingdom or paradise and the other does not? In the words of Abraham Heschel, one of the most influential modern-day prophets, few are guilty, but all are responsible. It was not legal obligation or civic duty that Heschel spoke of, but moral responsibility of all people to create a just society. If God expected us to build a paradise on earth, where exceptional happiness and delight could be always experienced by all of its residents, then they would be rather unfair and unrealistic. However, if we were to understand the word paradise as it was originally conceived in ancient Persian, enclosure, like a garden or park in which peace, safety, and security are but ashore, Think the Garden of Eden or the green pastures of Psalm 23. Then perhaps such a thing is achievable. Can we imagine and create a society that promises peace, safety, and security to all of its residents regardless of their differences? What would the two criminals have been like were they given the chance to live in a community based on justice and shalom? Are we willing to build such a paradise in our neighborhood today?
Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. From Maya Angelou's eulogy at the funeral of James Baldwin, December the 8th, 1987, in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, New York City. I will speak of James Baldwin, my friend and brother. A short brown man came to the door and looked at me. He had the most extraordinary eyes I'd ever seen. When he completed his instant x-ray of my brain, lungs, liver, heart, bowels, and spinal column, he smiled and said, come in, and opened the door. He opened the door all right. I knew Jim loved me when he gave me to Gloria and Paula, Wilmer, and David Baldwin, and all the rest of his siblings. And when he took me to Mother Baldwin and said, just what you don't need, another daughter, but here she is. I knew that he knew black women may find lovers on street corners or even in church pews, but brothers are hard to come by and are as necessary as air and as precious as love. James Baldwin knew that black women in this desolate world, black women in this cruel time, which has no soundness in it, have a quiet need for brothers. He knew that a brother's love redeems a sister's pain. His love opened the unusual door for me and I am blessed that James Baldwin was my brother. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder, lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, Small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity, our memory suddenly sharpen, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid. Promise walks, never taken. Great souls die and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls dependent upon their nurture, now shrink, wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. We're not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die, after a period peace blooms slowly and always irregularly, spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration, our senses restored, never to be the same whisper to us, they existed, they existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed.
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain. In his heart, there was a sudden yearning tenderness for holy Alicia, desire, sharp and awful as a reflecting knife to serve the body of Alicia and lie where Alicia lay, to speak in tongues as Alicia spoke and without authority to confound his father. Yet this had not been the moment. It was as far back as he could go, but the secret, the turning, the abysmal drop was farther back in darkness. As he cursed his father, as he loved Alicia, he had even then been weeping. He had already passed his moment, was already under the power, had been struck and was going down. Ah, uh, down. And to what purpose, where? To the bottom of the sea, the bowels of the earth, to the heart of the fiery furnace, into a dungeon deeper than hell, into a madness louder than the grave. What trumpet sound would awaken him? What hand would lift him up? For he knew as he was struck again and screamed again, his throat like burning ashes. And as he turned again, his body hanging from him like a useless weight, a heavy rotting carcass that if he were not lifted, he would never rise his father, his mother, his aunt, Alicia, all were far above him, wanting, watching his torment in the pit. They hung over the golden barrier, singing behind them, light around their heads, weeping perhaps for John struck down so early and no, they could not help him anymore. Nothing could help him anymore. He struggled, struggled to rise up and meet them. He wanted wings to fly upward and meet them in that morning, that morning where they were. But his struggles only thrust him downward. His cries did not go upward, but rang in his own skull.
I thirst. We need water to live, and having access to drinking water supplies is necessary to maintain sustainable societies. However, due to global climate change, access to safe drinking water to quench our thirst is becoming increasingly more difficult. The destiny and well-being of humans and the natural world are intertwined and interdependent, as the following scripture reminds us. For the creation waits with eager longing, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. A poem by Lois Red Elk entitled All Thirst Quenched, written for her granddaughter, expresses such connection and hope. I didn't want to score the sky that year, but grandma's words taunted my senses. If there's a thirst, then you need to pity the flowers in a loud voice. Ask the frogs why they are being punished. Stomp on the ground and talk to the dry clay about cracking open the earth. I know challenging the sky is risky. Last but not least, burn cedar, and pray the lightning doesn't strike your town. That night, the stars disappeared. So did the birds. Perhaps it was the season for rain or the dance. In the western distance, we thought we heard cannon blasts. Looking over, we watched the horizon filled with lightning strikes. Rain couldn't pour hard enough over the thirsty plain. Accompanying clouds called to thunder's voice in extreme decimals, requesting all the water heaven could send forth to come. Rain and more rain filled empty stream bottoms. Rivers who had pulled their dry banks farther and farther from their center begged for a drink to startle dusty beds with a flooding roar. Lives in dormant places begin to stir and awaken. The lives of water beings, those that swim, the ones that hop, and the ones that fly begin to stir. That year, all thirst was quenched.
It is finished. Indigenous people throughout history have been killed in large numbers and our leaders have been humiliated. Our rituals have been demonized. Our natural resources and land have been stolen and our culture has been appropriated. And during all that time, colonizers have thought it is finished, but it wasn't. My body aches as I imagine Matthew, Ronnie, Sakia, those at polls, and other LGBTQIA2 S plus people being beaten to death, shot, stabbed, often alone and scared. As their aggressors stopped because there was no more life to take, they all thought it is finished, but it wasn't. The people who murdered Fred, Malcolm, Martin, Medgar, Robert, and others for being civil rights activists, for threatening the status quo and the power of white supremacy thought as they saw their victims take their last breath, it is finished, but it wasn't. Venus, Amanda, Alexa, and so many other trans people, particularly trans brown and black women, are murdered every year and their murderers may triumphantly think it is finished, but it isn't. Separating children from their parents at the border, holding unaccompanied minors at detention centers, and criminalizing people for seeking a better life for their family is devastating. And those in charge may think it is finished, but it isn't. Ahmed, Ahmad, Brianna, George, and countless other Black people have been brutally murdered throughout history for being Black in the U.S. White supremacy continues to proclaim that it is finished, but it isn't. Bills taking away our voting rights as citizens of the U.S. are being proposed throughout the country, making some think it is finished, but it isn't. There are laws throughout the world that make some groups of people illegal and take away people's rights, making us think it is finished, but it isn't. And even though we know la lucha, the struggle continues, and even though we face a winding uphill journey, and we can see the crosses at Calvary ready for us, and even though we hear those familiar, thunderous, frightening words, it is finished, we know better. We have seen and heard life germinating. It is finished, Jesus mutters with his last breath. And the entire creation, though grieving, breathes in unison. No, it is not. It is just beginning.
Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Poet Wilfred Owen trained young men for the front, and he wrote to Osbert Sitwell in July 1918, I see to it that he is dumb and stands to attention before his accusers. With a piece of silver I buy him every day and with maps make him familiar with the topography of Golgotha. Here's the poem. So Abram rose and clave the wood and went and took the fire with him and a knife. And as they sojourned both of them together, Isaac the firstborn spake and said, My father, behold the preparations, fire and iron, but where the lamb for this burnt offering? Then Abram bound the youth with belts and straps and builded parapets and trenches there and stretched forth the knife to slay his son. When lo, an angel called him out of heaven saying, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. Behold, a ram, caught in the thicket by the thorns, offer the ram a pride instead of him. But the old man would not so, but slew his son, and half the seed of Europe, one by one. Yet we still call this Friday good, for the mystery of mercy it accomplishes in us. The great William Langlan wrote, And all the wickedness in the world that man might work or think is no more to the mercy of God than a live coal dropped into the sea. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you.